audience. It's live now. Yeah. It's live now. Say hi to your yeah, Periscope so just, audience. Hello, yeah. Periscope audience. So if you don't know, Periscope is a relatively new app. Yeah, a couple weeks. And it's uh, to do live streaming across the world. So we are live streaming right now to who knows how many people. At the moment, yes. one. <laughs> but yeah. One it's user across yeah. the world. But she sends love. <laughs> Two. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to jump on into things. So, uh, so thank you for, for coming out this evening. So uh, Mara is a well-known social media activist, and uh, you've done many different projects. I think some of the best known are Museum Week, Ask a Curator, also the recent Museum Selfie yeah. event um, in the Love Theater. And you also do uh, Museum Mix and Museum Camp. Yep. So we think you have a lot of different projects going all Always. the time. And the thing I like best that I think maybe this is why maybe this is why I think we get along so well. Uh, is that you're this is from your website itself, is that you're either an advocate or a troublemaker, depending on which side of the fence that you're on. Absolutely. And I like your uh, ability to be able to stir things up and I yeah. think also to be kind of to stand outside of sometimes the museum and yeah. be able to kind of comment on that. And then to be able to advocate for different digital culture, particularly social media in the context of the museum. So, as a starting point tonight, what did you do before there was the internet? <laughs> uh, what did I do? Yeah, there was life before that. But, um, yeah, I've always been into like gaming, and I've always been into, I, I said before I had a, uh, a Professor Al, you know, when I was younger, and it was like, it was always calculating things. It was always, I was always wondering what, how that was working and why it was working. Um, so, yeah, my, I was very lucky that my first job was with the Attorney General's office when they were just going to, to work processing and mainframe computers. So that was when I was 17. Wow. So I was, I don't remember much about like before that. I'm not that old by the way, but it is like, you know, it seems to be, I have always been there. But I also played Nintendo games and stuff yeah, that's like what that. You're saying, yeah. yeah, so. Well, and then, so how did you make kind of the transition, you know, now that we're kind of moving more into kind of social media yeah. context and museums, and you kind of made your own way there. And kind of made almost kind of a yeah, career out of it. The one, the one thing I always get asked is like, why do you do this stuff? I'm like, because somebody had to. Like nobody else was doing it. So I was like, hey, I'll, I'll do it. And then it was just one of those things where um, because I don't work for an institution or I don't work for one person or another person, um, I was kind of safe because nobody could fire me. <laughs> so it, it's, it's great. It's great for this to be in. I don't get paid a lot, but it's not. It's never going to be about the money. Sure. Um, but yeah, but when I started off with mainframe computers and things, you had you had message boards and bulletin boards. So right. there's always that social element of talking to somebody who was behind the screen. So that never scared me. Um, also, I come from a big family, so if you didn't talk, like you were, you just lost out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so being that that aspect of it, and when and so I moved on from the message boards and from from uh, forums, remember message right, forums so and things like forums. that. And then you know Facebook and Twitter came along, and it was just a natural progression to go on to that. Wait, it's, that's actually funny when you mentioned forums. So my prior job is I actually met in an artist.org. It was a Walker project. But there was these really active forums yeah. back in the early 2000s. Yeah. And the last post ever on there, it wasn't because we turned it off, it was because it was the last post. It said, shh, the forums are sleeping. Yeah. And because just people quit using them, and that's when Facebook came out. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's one of the questions I always get is, and I'm pretty sure you're going to address this, is about what's the next thing. And I'm right. like, there, there is always the next thing. So when people are saying, like, you know, Facebook is going to go away or whatever, I'm like, one billion people are not going to stop talking. They're just going to find some place else to do it, and you better be on that one with them. Right. When, when they transition into that one. Um, and that's when you get into sort of the trends of things and paying attention to what other people are doing. Well, that's a good transition. Then. So currently, so what platforms are you using right now? I stick with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, Periscope, um, because that's what I'm comfortable with, and that's where my audience is, or that's where people who are talking that, that with my subjects are, are there. Um, but I, I do tend to say my daughter's 13, and I tend to follow her around social media. So I got on the Instagram because I was trying to figure out what my, my daughter was doing. She's now left and going to Snapchat. She's fine because I can't figure that out. Um, but as soon as I do, I'm sure she'll leave and she'll go somewhere else, and then I'll have something else to figure out. But it is about paying attention to what, what young people are doing, and because and they are leading it, but they're, you know, they're quite quiet about it. Right. So stop them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, obviously, it's always on the next thing. Things do fade away. Are there certain platforms you see right now that are waning? 
I don't think they're waiting, but I, I always like look at Pinterest and things like that because uh, Flickr is another one. Sure. It was like the go-to god that you know, yeah. I think visual was going to be that one, and Instagram came. And I think Pinterest still has a huge following, but it's mainly for fashion and food. Right. Um, you know, I said to you, like Asian art won't do as well on Pinterest as 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 it would on Instagram or as mm -hmm. it would on Facebook. Uh, type thing. So it's about your personal collection and seeing what your followers are doing. You know, a lot of people are looking at you jumping ship with Facebook, and I keep saying that's still a hot one to, to be on. You're you're do more damage not being on it than right. than to, 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 to make it slow. So that seems kind of preemptive in some ways. It's almost like thinking it's it's been around too long now. And it's yeah, and I, well, I think we got burnt a lot of times with some yeah. of the platforms we look at. Oh, you, you mentioned about MySpace dying now, and it's like, yeah, we everybody put all their eggs in one basket with that. Right. We've learned not to do that. Well, what do you think? So what's the next thing then? What are kind of the what do you think are kind of for the trends going on now? Yeah. yeah. Again, I think it's going to be video based. So YouTube, which I didn't mention, was YouTube. Uh, more and more, we got YouTubers who are hot right now on and, right. and, and Snapchat. So it's going to be the behavior of what's coming out now of the people. How many of you here are like active? Like, just I'm just kind of curious. Like, how many of you have a Twitter account that you use regularly? Sorry, I thought she just dropped my phone. I, I thought I was going to jump off the stage. I dropped your charger, actually. Yeah, fine. We were already talking before that, that, that there was a certain amount of anxiety because you didn't have your phone. My phone's there. My phone's there. Um, how many of you have like have YouTube channels that you post to? Just be curious. How many of you have a Pinterest page? How many of you sign up on Periscope or on that? How about Snapchat? It's a generational shift. It is. I'm trying to explain that Snapchat to me. I'm trying to explain why YouTube is really good is, um, because it's like Google, so you have see it. So your search engine optimization is like really hot on that one. Well, it's interesting seeing now how you know certain artists are using these platforms too to create work. And yeah. I think maybe I was, I remember I was telling you, I was telling some of my staff today. So you know, the Walk Arts Center was up prior. Their shop actually has anything they're calling the intangibles. Yeah. You read about this. So. One of the artists, Alex Soap, actually put out a set of photographs through Snapchat. So you bought the suite of photographs, it was sent to you, you looked through them, and then they're gone. So you got one experience, and there was never anything. That was, that was there. yeah. Uh, yeah, that would annoy me. <laughs> yeah, especially. I, I, think, I think what's really interesting though is digital artists are having a really hard time right now right. because they're thinking that they're making art and put it on YouTube, and that's digital yeah. art, and that's not really the definition of it. But um, then you say, well, what is the definition? I'm, I have no idea. Because <laughs> I'm not an artist, but I know that's on it. Well, let's let's move into let's. Well, I have one more question. This thing. So, how many actually? How many actual like Twitter accounts do you manage and, and run? Twelve. 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 Yeah, I know, sad. <laughs> I see a sire of like people going, oh man, she needs life. Uh, but you just do it off your phone and it just comes up. And not all of them are as active as, as my main account. Sure, sure, so. of course. Um, so let's let's move into a little bit more into kind of this in the context of the museum. So, so I think one interesting question is like, so what are museums doing wrong as far as social media? Mm -hmm. start and that's the rest of the night. I'm jumping right in. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that they're they're using it to broadcast and they're, they're forgetting the word social. And I think that's the number one element that most people who fail on social media is because they're not being social. They're talking about themselves, or they're talking about their, their today and um, Periscope. And then I also did um, so, some photos today. And when I was doing the Periscope, I was standing in front of a picture and if I didn't get any hearts, I was like, oh, you don't like this, let me show you this one, I'll get hearts. So although I was getting that, that reaction, it was a social you know, social thing that was going on there. And I also think that they're not giving everybody access to it. So there seems to be one voice, which I think is completely wrong, because there's not one voice in a, in, a, in, a, in a mission for any museum. There's always going to be multiple uh, threads that are out there. Um, so I always give like the example of the Natural History Museum, which has, I think, the quote was 50 Twitter accounts down for Natural History Museum because they let the curators have them. They let, there's a lady, she's she's fly girl. She, she curates flies at the Natural History Museum. She has this cult following of 8,000 followers. The paleontologist who is all about the dinosaurs only has a couple hundred. So you would think that that would be the complete opposite. But they, the, the museum has let whoever wants to have an account to have an account and speak, speak about what they're doing. They still have their main account. But right. you know, it's it's about letting those multiple voices come out, and I think once museums let go of that power and say that oh, it all has to go through me, it makes it it makes a big difference, and it makes a big difference in morale. 
Well, I think it's, it's, it's that control thing, right? Ah, oh, power, control, <laughs> yeah. And that, that flows over so many different departments, too. Well, there's a level of trust, and I think it's to yeah. kind of trust that people are on a mission and they're going to represent yeah. well. And I think, you know, I think now that social media's been around enough, I mean, and we talked about this a little bit too, is that, and I think you could speak to this, is like, I know that my personal accounts and my accounts to the museum yeah. blend together completely. I would never put something on either. Yeah, yeah. That would be, you know, that would yeah. come back on me. Yeah. Just one is a lot more of my kid than the other one is. But that's the kind of knowing that, that they flow. Yeah. And they become kind of an identity there. And I also think that, that you know, giving that power over to your employees, and, and, and if you if you worry about it, I, will, I always say to them, if you're worried about it, then why do you hire them? Like, you know, <laughs> we, we don't trust them. This, they're going to be talking to the public. This is just another vessel for them to talk to the public. Um, and there, there's a big power issue there. I, I don't know if it's just power. I also think there's a misunderstanding because all usually management, and I don't mean all management because there's ever power scoping. I don't mean all management because there's a lot of cool ones. But I think management only know the negative stories in the press. So media pays, plays a big right. role in what can happen and doesn't happen. Because they're like, oh no, that one tweet went viral. And, and you say to them, what does the word viral mean? And they don't even know. They just know it, it, it's, a, it's a bad thing, right? You know, so it is that education also. It's funny when you mentioned the viral thing. So I, I, mean, I was going to avoid all the cat stuff, but I'm going to say one <laughs> side check. Um, so when I was at the locker and all the cat video yeah. stuff was going on, I got brought into the marketing office and I'm like, that was great what you did there. Can you make that happen for everything yeah, else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, it doesn't work. No. Like, if I could do that, I would make so much money. Yeah. I, I, I think for people, because <laughs> I've been more offending a few times, people are like, okay, can you tweet this out for me? I'm like, yeah, I can, but you know, it's a different time zone. Like, I'm going to go nowhere. So, right. yeah, it, it, and it is all about knowing that, you know, who's on when. Well, I think that comes back a little bit to the timeliness of it. So we talked a little bit about this, about it, like when you have multiple voices, when you loosen up some of that freedom, you have the ability to take advantage of things that happen much yeah. more quickly. On the spot. And to have them, they have to go through a certain protocol, to go through a certain system. Yeah. You just miss opportunities because no, of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially, and it's so scripted by that point. And we can sense that. We, we can smell out a scripted tweet in a, in a heartbeat or something that was on Facebook that was scripted. And again, now now I'm just going to either mute you or follow you because you're not being social. Right, and I and, and so, now you just lost an advocate. Right, because now I'm not going to tweet you. Now I'm not going to talk about you. So. Well, I think what you're saying then too is like I mean, this is like you know knowing that there's people from our departments here, even in the audience, but it's like decentralizing social media from the marketing department where Alpha lives yeah. in a museum to yeah. being a more shared. Yeah. I, absolutely. I, said, I still think there needs to be probably a, a head of, sure, a, a thing, but I, like I said, there is a National History Museum library, uh, London account. It's still there, but they, they will retweet every once in a while the paleontologist or fly girl, you know, just to, just to let it out there. But um, yeah, it, it's given that own voice and also it is that talk to us. They're walking through maybe at night or they're working late. They could just take a picture and feel awkward, you know, feel like they could share that and go on, here's the museum at night or here's, here's a flower you haven't seen type thing. Right. Um, and it makes it more personal. Well, that feels like, I mean, some of the things that have the best traction, and so we've seen here is like behind the scenes. It's oh, always, that, always, right? yeah. You're getting a glimpse into something Actually, that you're able to normally see. Your, your role on social media is to be the eyes and ears of people who aren't with you. And that, that's how I see it. So when I'm walking, I, mean, I might not like the art or I might not like the, the collection, but I know that I'm really lucky with, with, with what I get to do when I get to travel. So I'll tweet a picture and say, you know, here, here's this, this is this within the collection. I usually pray that nobody asks me questions because I'm, I'm not an art person <laughs> or I'm not a collection person. But um, I am always the eyes and ears, and you should use social media to be the eyes and ears to share what you are seeing for people right. in that moment. Well, we just think in a little bit to like when you've been here the last couple of days of walking around and using Periscope around the art collection. Yeah. And kind of just some of the things you've been able to trigger some conversations just from that. Yeah, it was, it was, um, uh, Sylvia and I did one today. We, we did se several of them today, um, which was nice because she was able to talk about the art. Because I was just kind of pointing out <laughs> at things. I did the, uh, the co contemporary art. I think it was the design yeah. type thing. Mm -hmm. And I was getting people going, like that, don't like that. I got to an argument with a guy who refused to believe one of the objects was a state work, so I had to go back and prove it to him. I don't know, <laughs> but what's really great is like he was from Italy, and I'm going, is this a miscommunication between language? <laughs> like, where, where, where's the issue here? Um, but I was also able to share pictures on, on Facebook and on Twitter, and people were so impressed with the, the eclectic uh, collection that you guys have here. 
Um, and then when, when I went upstairs and did the periscope on the guy, uh, lady doing the live conservation, that went mental. There was like 164 likes on that one. Right. Um, and it, it's, out, it's out in the open. She's not downstairs in a basement like most of the uh, conservatives right. are. And just a little dialogue with her, and then people started asking me questions that I got to, to, to ask her straight away. Um, you know, about the different paints and that, why she was using a certain light and what it was like to get the questions. And that was just me being the eyes and ears for other people. Right. And I think, you know, some of our role in museums, how do we prompt those things without having to put like, here's your mom, I tweet about this. It's like, actually do that. No, I, so, so one of the things that I love is when I go to a, a museum and I see a wall with a hashtag on it. Cause now I know I have permission to Instagram and tweet, tweet that because you just put a hashtag there. So the next thing I'm going to do is look for Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay. you, you have you have a hashtag there that means Wi-Fi to me, um, which isn't always the case in every country, but it's getting better. But it it is that that little sign gives people permission to well, to share. Yeah. So now I know I'm allowed to have my phone out. Now I don't have to worry about photographs. Now I don't I don't have to worry about. I will always ask about Periscope first because that's a, that's a new medium and something different. But a hashtag is such a simple way to say to people, yes. You you can talk about this all you like. Right. Let's talk about that. So yeah, I, mean, I, I, I knew I knew I knew I was going there. Yeah, you can see I'm going to take a bait. So, um, you do not have to mention what museum, but recently you were in a museum and yes. had an experience. Can you tell about your experience with Periscope? Yeah. So I um I'm, I'm really good friends with this museum, and I tweeted them, and I was like, hey, I'm finally in your museum. I haven't I've never been here. Do you mind if I Periscope? And they said, yeah, absolutely. This is all through Twitter. Yeah, absolutely, Periscope. I start periscope. I start periscope, and people start following. And the security guard comes up and says, "Ma'am, you're not allowed to take any video here." I fail to shut the video down during this conversation, so people online live stream. it's live stream. So people are hearing this. Now the security guy is just doing his job. I'm not mad at him at all, but I didn't want to look like an idiot, so I'm going, "No, but I got a tweet here," <laughs> and that's when I realized that it was all this is being recorded, and it turned into a Twitter storm. It turned into a Twitter storm because I had asked permission and people saw that I asked permission and this happened. But the great thing is, and it, you know, all, all credit to this to this place is they changed their policy. So this happened on a Saturday or on a Sunday. Sunday. On a Sunday, they're closed on Monday and Tuesday their policy was done, changed, and everybody in, in the uh, everybody within the front of house anything was told about it. Which is gonna keep happening with all this new technology right. and we can we can swing right into wearable technology if you're ready. So let's go there. Because yeah. wearable technology is my is another big passion of mine, and and um, I think that's going to preempt mm -hmm. a lot of changes for a lot of people hiding behind closed doors. Well, I think so. So you, yeah. I mean, so what what do you think is working with wearable? Tech? I know it's early. Yeah, fair and right. you know things like Google Glass have kind of like not really taken off. I yes and no. So with accessibility, mm -hmm. they've taken off majorly. Sure. So that's one thing that we haven't, the media hasn't talked about, which again, this is where I will not bash the media, but I, I often say if it wasn't Google Glass, if it was a startup like Pebble, that we probably would still be seeing this this, this out there. But because it was Google, really it was evil because it had a camera. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Yeah, but Pebble is a startup, and it's a, it's a watch, and, and it, you know it's like the Apple Watch, and um, and I have one, and it, anytime my phone buzzes, the, the watch does something. But the fundamental flaw is I don't wear a watch, so that whole behavior was not there for me. At least with Google Glass, I got to look, right? You got you got to look out. You can look like an idiot, but you still you still got to look. Um, so you got the, but but I often say to people who have like Fitbits and stuff, I'm like, yeah, you, everybody's like data scared. Know, where does that data go? Who's, who's doing this with Google? But yet you ask people who have Fitbits where their data is going, they have no idea. And it's going somewhere. It's going somewhere. It is. Exactly. <laughs> so, but it's, it, if you're scared about people and right. knowing that thing, you got a hell of a life ahead of you, because that's all we're going to be doing at this yeah. point. Um, so my thing is like, people know me, they, well, they think they know me from online. You know, but you talk to my daughter, she'll tell you the real story. <laughs> yeah, but you can have this perception of how you, what you want to do and how you want to do it. And I'm, I don't curate too much about what goes online, but I am cautious. Mm -hmm. But I don't care about GPS because I'm usually lost. So I usually say to people, hey, help me out here. This is where I'm at. But I don't see a fear in letting people know where you're at. I think I think that, that there's the media scare among you know, people are going to you know, track you. And, you know, people are too bored with life. You know, they're, they're doing their own thing. Well, I think you know somebody had a kind of interesting analogy, like thinking about Facebook. That if you just said twenty years ago, 
that you're willingly going to give all your photographs, yep. every place you've been, yeah. all your family members, like just out to the public. Yeah. You think you're crazy. Yeah, but I'm not, well, I am, but besides well, the point, right. I think it is, it is, but my, my, my argument with wearable technology and museums is that people, it's not going to go away. I think in the UK, it was like 8.1 billion industry last year. Um, it's not something that we're just going to see like MySpace or you know, Google Glass just kind of get go away. It's going to get more and more prompt uh, in our faces. And, you know, we got this whole internet of things where things are being connected together. And you guys don't need to know any about that, but you need to know of it. That's my important thing because right. these people are going, the public is going to bring this into museums, just like they brought in the smartphones and museums took six years to react to smartphones. Really, honestly, yeah, six years. Sure. So I laugh because we're still building apps. Who downloads <laughs> the freaking apps? Like, you know, even if you download it, you don't lose it or you lose it once or it sits on your phone type thing. They need to delete it almost. Yeah. And they need to delete it, yeah. yeah. Or you, you could you already visit it type thing. Right. So, and most of the information that's on the app is already on the internet. It's just, it's just contained in this bubble, but it's something that is a, a tick box for a lot of museums to say that they have. So what do you think with, with wearable technology, like kind of projecting ahead, like what do you what do you see coming and what do you see how museums can tap into that right. and be a little bit more proactive than they've been with smartphones? So we had like the Imperial War Museum and now the Grand Palais in, in uh, Paris are using Google Glass still mm -hmm. for that for that uh, additional layer. It's like a tier system to an audio guide and it emerges you. And, and I, I often get mad about the Imperial War Museum one because I'm, I'm really not into war. And, it, this this Google Glass program that they, they did made me look at a tank for 10 minutes. 10 minutes at looking at a tank. It wasn't moving, right? Like, I, I didn't even know it was there. I've been in this museum so many times, but because it immersed me so much into that right. one with the dialogue and with the video that was coming on, and it was a customized little thing. So I do think augmented reality, and I do think that mm -hmm. it, the, the visual ones are going to be strong. We also got audio guys, which are now getting smarter. And that's really, really, we're just on the cusp of this trend. Um, and there are people pushing the boat out, but it's still clunky, but it will get better to where they're either um, GPS or RFID. Right. And they can tell where you're at and start instigating the conversation should you want it. Um, and again, we've got like eye beacons, which I'm not quite sure about, although we're putting a lot of emphasis on it. But I think it's just because we're, we're putting emphasis on eye beacons because it's there, but really, I don't see that as sustainable. Yeah, there's some things with beacons. I know we've been, I've been having some discussions with yeah. musicians here because there's a lot of things that we've commissioned our site specific music pieces like around our campus. Yeah. That because of the artists themselves don't necessarily want to have those pieces um, online just out there because that's not the piece. The piece is about that place. Yeah. Is that can we put a beacon yeah. in a site so you can only view that piece within 15 feet of the site? Yeah. And that's where the beacon thing you may experiment with something like that. But it has some, a lot of limitations. You still, it's still, you still got to give your phone permission. Absolutely. So it's still not going to be transparent. You still got to have that conversation, which is the downfall. Which, but I can see why Apple did it. Right. Because Apple doesn't want to become Google and get like um, people get scared of them. So right. it's an intelligent move on their end, but it's still not seamless. <sighs> but we, with the audio guys that you, you know, can be seamless because you chose to pick one up. Right. Yeah, and I will say top tip with audio guides, always get the family one and the kid ones because that's where great information is. The adult audio guides suck. <laughs> <laughs> they talk at a level that's like up here for some reason. It's always like a high pitch voice. <laughs> what I like about you is like, I think your approach is really about this access. Like think of oh, making things accessible. It's not dumbing things down. It's no. about making things accessible. And I think something that we've talked about even like kicking off this whole conversation with is that the acknowledgement that museums are in competition with entertainment oh, yeah, yeah, out there, yeah. right? And it's like, I think if you deny that, like it's, I think you're already I, losing to a certain extent. Yeah. It isn't to say that it's the same, no. but that's your audience that you're competing with. Yeah, so but the, the big thing is, is not talking to the people and finding out why they're going, it's talking to the people who aren't going and figure out why, well, how you can get them in. And a lot of places are competing and we can even talk about Annapolis. In theory, Annapolis is, is competing with the Children's Museum, but this it's not a competition at all. But like people might see it that way. But you're also competing with the movie theater or you're competing you know, the, the amusement parks that are out there. There's so many different elements in our world that we're just constantly wanting to be entertained and busy. And you say museums, and they're like, really? That's not going to entertain me. Like, that, that's not going to go there. 
but you can actually get a full day. I mean, I've been here for three days. <laughs> I, 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 I gotta say, I, I, I was told, texting my daughter, I'm like, I've been in this insane museum for three days. She's like, you're not going nuts? I'm like, no, because there's so much to right. see being there. You guys have the grounds and stuff, but it's paying attention to how you can get those people in there. And if you can make those shifts, and if, if it is the language that you're using or the fact that you do have you know, all these you know, O'Keefe's and everything else in there, but you also got the contemporary art, which I was trying to find faces in some of it, because that's, sure. I don't know artists. So I was just like, okay, I'm gonna entertain myself and see how many faces I can find in this art. What's amazing is just the, kind of the perceptions and kind of the, like I think the false perceptions at times. And yeah. we've had a little bit of a debate. You may have heard that we're charging a mission now, and there's been some things I'm like, um, so in some of that conversation, what it's been interesting watching it, even though it's been a time that should quit, but um, is that people talking about it like they were there 25 years ago on their fourth grade field trip and they saw everything and it's yeah. exactly the same it was then and it is now. And like that, that is not just about us, that's about museums in general. In general. It's, it's a international, static thing, internationally, yeah. right? And it's like changing some of that perception that it's not static, yeah. it's constantly changing and the using ways that social media can show that every yeah. day it's something different. Yeah. And I think also when, when people do come in and tweet about it, it's, it's not just tweeting about yourself, it's have, right. retweeting them and, and, and showing that it's not just you talking about how great it is, it's people coming into it, doing it. But yeah, I do think that um, one of my biggest things I usually talk to management about is to forget that it's a museum and use it as a space. So what would you do to bring space in? You, this is where you and I hooked up because sure, yeah. it's about using it as a disco. It's about using it as you know, a drive-in theater. It's about using it as anything else to get everybody in. And instead of educating, just expose them. Yeah. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Like I always brought my daughter to a museum and our thing was to learn one thing. And the one thing could be what cake we liked. It didn't have to do anything about the art. There was, not, there was no pressure whatsoever about it. But I have conversations with her now. She scares me because, like, I'm like, "Oh, you actually took that in, or you learned, you learned from that museum when, when we went there." Right. But it's that exposure is more important than education, which I know any educational person is like cringing right now, and I do apologize, but it is true. Well, I think there's a lot. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say that one story that I told you about the teenager that I met in in, in my hometown. We have a, a a museum next to us. There's a school not too far away, and there was a, a teen takeover day. And teens there um, didn't know the museum existed, even though it was like right around the corner. And the quote that killed me was the, guy, the kid was like, I think he was 15, he was like, I've never been to a museum without a clipboard. Because every single time he goes to a museum, he has to prove his learning. And that just killed me. I was like, that, that now he hates it for the rest of his life. I can't do anything about him, but I'm going to make damn sure I can help the other people, which is where I started Teens and Museums. Which is great. Why don't you talk a little bit about the Teens and Museum program? That was just, that was just me getting yeah. really, really annoyed that nobody was doing anything and there was no collective one voice for, for young people. And I hate the word teens, just as much as everybody else. But um, my daughter at the time, I think, was 10 or 11. And she had done all the trails, right? So you go to a museum and you get the kids pack. My kids done all of them, right? So now she's four and we go. So I was like, okay, what's, what's the next thing for, for young people? They're like, oh, no, we've got educational programs for schools. I was like, she's 10. She doesn't know about that. So we started doing our own thing. <clears throat> but then I, the more I talked to museums, I'm like, nobody has anything for this gap of, of students. They, it's either they're educating them, but there's nothing for them just to go into, a, a young people to go into a museum and do, unless they went to school or they joined the young people's program, which are great, but not everybody can commit to once sure. a week or once a month or you know, pay for the transport there. So that just kicked off teens and museums because again, somebody had to do it. Apparently it was me. <laughs> uh, you've done that several times. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's great because anybody who's doing stuff with young people just send me the information. So I actually don't work with young people. But like right now I'm doing a, a, a series of blog posts from the Smithsonian because they're just setting up a new mm -hmm. young people's thing. So she's chronicling her journey about setting this up on, okay. on, on the website. That's great. Okay, I'm gonna take a question here. We're gonna totally change direction a little cool. bit. Selfie sticks, oh. pro con. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's appropriate. So. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I didn't ever swear. Um, no, I hate selfie sticks. I hate selfie sticks. Um, which I know a lot of people like you, but you like you do museum selfie day. Um, but up until museum selfie day, I also never do museum selfies. But the stick is just obnoxious, right? So <laughs> like you do this, that's your personal space. You you do this, you stick out. Like now you're. Does everybody know what a selfie stick is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a weapon. 
<laughs> of mass destruction. Yeah, it's a weapon. It's like, it's like going to a museum and open up an umbrella. Well, okay, this yeah, is my face here. Like, you know, you can't do anything about it. It, it is that obnoxious. So but outside, you want to do it on the garden? You want to you have one? That, that's fine. I'm not anti them. I'm anti them in the museum. That there's a, there's a clarification there. <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting how quickly, again, like policy changes very quickly, the banning them, well, it had to happen. But. Yeah, so I got a phone call one time, I was in London, and um, I got a phone call from a reporter, and she was just like talking, and at the end of it, I was like, hey, can you tell me what this is about? <laughs> Usually should ask that first. I learned my lesson, always ask that first now. And apparently National Gallery had, had uh, yeah. said no to selfie sticks, and Next thing I know, I was like on all the news as the anti, you know, museum selfie stick person. So <laughs> I was like, because I thought, I thought, because it was in the Times and I thought it was going to be in the Times online and it was like actually in print. I was like, wow, this is scary. Like, you I got to <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta not say things or I got to like figure out what they're talking about from now on. <laughs> not that I would change that, actually, though. <laughs> well, of course not. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so let's let's talk about let's go back to museums again. Let's talk about maybe one of the bigger kind of challenges. So I think we know that over the past you know decade or longer, the museums have been in decline as yeah. far as audiences. And so we're all kind of trying to figure out the code of getting audiences in and, and figure out what that is. And then one of the responses has been bringing in blockbuster shows or other kind oh, of like yeah. spectacle-based shows. And we can name many different examples. They yeah. The most Recent probably in the U.S. is the York show and said, "Well, then it's not getting great reviews." Yes. Um, but you were talking about the Damien Hirst show that was yeah. um, over so London. London. Uh, so that's one response. Yeah. You know, another is figuring out new ways to kind of utilize yeah. what you already have, but engaging an audience differently. I mean, what's your take on that? So my my whole thing, and I think I think it, it, it addresses everything that I do. is about community, and you're making communities no matter where you go. And <clears throat> with blockbusters, it's it's a it's a revolving door. If you're getting the people in, you're getting the people out. When you do consistently good work, you're building communities of people who are coming back to see what you have next. And there's a, it's a, and then, then again, it goes back to the advocacy and they're part of you and they start saying, we. And that's such a big thing. And you get these people saying, this is my museum. And I, you know, I'm gonna take ownership of this museum and I care about this museum. Huge shift, huge shift. And you can't do that with blockbusters. You could try all you want, but it's never ever gone to work with a blockbuster. Are you saying you should never do a blockbuster? No, I think you got you have to do them because it, it it's going to have that spark and it will get new people in. But I don't think that that should be the only solution. I think you should invest more time in the community aspect of things. And, and what do you what have you seen? I and mean, give some examples of places that really do the community well. I, yeah, there's actually yeah. I'm, I got to go stick back over to the UK because that's kind of what I used to. But um, you got places like Wolverhampton, which has a semi not the best reputation in, in all of England, but they, they really care about the community and they they like moved the bus stop to be in front so that when the young people were waiting outside they can come inside if it was raining and just starting to do stuff. I'm not talking about friends of museums. I think friends of museums are something completely different because there are people who always have friends of museums, but I'm sure. talking about people who take the ownership. Hortman's another one just doing great great work out there. Um, you know, even big ones like science museums, there's a lot of stuff. Like science museums just started doing um, autism um, days. Not not a lot of them, but they, they realized that some of the kids with autism found the place scary because it was so loud. That's taking ownership of that community and saying, right, right. If somebody said that, let's act on that one. So you can be a big institution and still do still talk to the people. I think part of this comes back to you coming back to what you said at the beginning about social media being social, yeah. so that you're actually having that communication. Yeah. Conversation where it feels like it's not the big entity, yeah, but it's a person. A yeah. So it's a voice there, but also lifting. Like we just recently lifted all the photography restrictions, yeah. oh, so that you can place you <laughs> can place you. yourself in the museum, which is the best advertising yeah. you could ever ask yep. for, because you're showing value in that and placing yourself. In yeah, and, I, and I'm talking about you just by by taking a picture of it or right. saying this is where I'm at, or you know checking in is a great thing. Like I I check in wherever I go. Maybe so I can remember where I've been. Okay, I'm old. Give me, give me some credit here. But it also tells everybody else where I'm at. And then they might go. So what I'll do in London is I'll, I'll be in London. I might have time in between a museum. And you don't gotta pay for a lot of museums in London, so it's a little bit different. But I'll go into like the British Museum and I'll tweet, "Hey, I'm in the British Museum. I have 20 minutes. What should I go see?" And I'll listen to. And I do like the scavenger hunt for people, and I take a picture of what they want. Right. Now I gamified it. Now I'm, now, I'm, now I'm making museums fun, even though I have no idea what I'm looking for, and often I'm going to the front of the house like, what is that? Because <laughs> like, they're, they're like giving me a name, like I don't know, I don't know names. Like, you know, um, 
So, yeah, so it, it is about letting people have that experience how they want it, not, not glaring at them because you're not staring at the paintings too long, which we all know. We all know that. Sure. Well, kind of just a, a little bit of a side question to it is that, so you've built this following and you have all these people and you, I mean, so we were talking a little bit before and I forget exactly where this was, but I remember seeing it because they were talking about the most influential mm -hmm. kind of like museums in, in, as far as social media is concerned. It's like the tape, the Smithsonian, and like number five is Mark. Yeah, I'm not a museum not though. Museum. <laughs> it's a fundamental flaw in your little <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> But it shows how much pull that you have, yeah. that you built it over time. But how did you build that? So how did you build those followers? I have no idea. How do you like, nurture that? I, I think it's being consistent. So, you know, I set myself some guidelines in the very, very beginning of my online life and my digital identity of like never to swear online and try to always be positive, which I said to you is I, I get really frustrated with some things, but I, gotta, I try to remain that positiveness out there. Um, but every once in a while, if I get mad online, you know I'm like punching the wall at hell. Like if, if I show any kind of anger online. And I think it's just being consistent. I'm constantly sharing. And, um, you know, I, I do state in my bio that I overshare, but I never share about certain things in my life because they need to be private and they can be private. Um, and, and that care. A lot of people think that I don't talk about my daughter because I call her C online. I call her C because her name's Charlotte, and that's way too many characters for for, for Twitter. Like if I if I knew that two, 13 years ago, that would be fine. But um, but it is about having those guards up. And, and right. no, but also if people ask me a question, I try to always acknowledge that anybody who reaches out to me, it's either a favor or a retweet, or I try to get back to them. If it's specifically to me, like if it's a question to me. If it says they're mentioning me, like a few of you guys mentioned that you were here tonight, I think I tried to retweet you or to acknowledge you, just to say thank you. And and, and if you had any questions later, you know that I'm I'm approachable. Right. <clears throat> and I think that's that's one thing that museums can really take a lesson with because sometimes museums don't acknowledge it. And I don't expect museums to answer every single tweet that they get because they get hundreds of them sometimes. But you just go and you nip one and you answer it, and now you just right. made an advocate of that person because you just acknowledge them. Well, I think that's where people get angry at times when they feel like they're yelling enough. You know, yeah, but if they look at the timeline and say, oh, they answered other people, it could right. just be like Smithsonian can't answer sure, anybody. Of course not. So yeah. it's just a matter of grabbing one or two and, and, and acknowledging that one. But if you're a smaller museum, by yeah. all means, there's no reason. Even if the answer is, which kills museums, I don't know. Right. If you got to say, I don't know, or I got to find out, that's not a men uh, mentality of museums normally. Because they, they are known as an authority, they're academia, they're supposed to know all. Social media says you're not God, and that's painful, but it's the truth, right? So, so kind of related question, how often do you have to block or unfollow people at any accounts? Never, never, because if they, if they annoy me, what I, I, I tend not to follow people until I have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't tend to, I don't think I've ever blocked anybody. It's like, impressive. Yeah. I you know, I think a lot of people think I'm too not, too nice to block. But it's just like really, if they, but I, I think people unfollow me because I, I do tweet a lot, and you know, sure. you don't think that you're just going to get museums because you're going to get tech, you're going to get library, you're going to get cake, you're going to get the fact that my dog never listens to me, you know, or or the rabbits are too big, or you know, you'll get all, you'll get everything with me. Um, so some people unfollow because they they just think it's too much noise, and that that's fair enough. I got one more big question. We'll open up some some questions maybe from the crowd out here. Um, Make me nervous. No. <laughs> so, you know, one motto that I know that we share, I use it in my presentations too, is to ask for uh, forgiveness rather than oh, yeah. permission. Oh, yeah. So, I think part of that is knowing where that line is, you know, too. That line, that right, right on the edge between, like, you know, I can apologize and not get fired. So, um, I don't got to worry about that. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a huge true. advantage. It is an advantage. It's, it is an advantage. And that's what. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you. <laughs> we'll use that later. So, um, because <laughs> Mara said so. Um, so, okay. but I think part of it's for a museum is like, you know, museums at times are like a big ship moving. It's a very slow ship yeah. and they're going to do a change. Like, what can museums do to be far more responsive and change some of that attitude and not put the, the blocks in place that most of the time the museums are self-imposed? Look, right? I'm, I'm getting ready to argue right now. Please see, I'm, I'm moving forward. <laughs> and I don't want to. Uh, no, but I think we, we have discussed this. And museums have museum time, which are, is not normal time to anybody else, right? Do we, do we agree on that one? Like, 
something <laughs> is three years for them, which should be it's like tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I, and, and we are living in a society that is so fast paced. And if the museums aren't giving it, they'll go to Google. And even if it's a Google image or if it's a, Google, a YouTube video, they'll get their knowledge somewhere else if museums aren't going to be responsive. So museums have this, they, if they're not careful, they're going to talk themselves out of a job because they're going to make themselves redundant because people are going to not want to wait anymore and they're, they're going to get pissed off, quite frankly, of, of saying, you know, we want to like you, but you guys aren't meeting us halfway. And I think that's a huge thing that across the board internationally museums are dealing with smaller museums are actually doing better because of that so where it used to be nationals and the big institutions were the ones that were gone and we put on the pedestal now we're looking at the smaller museums to go show them how, to, how it's done like you, you just put this in place do this like you, you guys just removed your photographs there's so still so many people who don't allow that and it's not happen to take everything to the board and it goes back to that trust of the employees that you have there and saying what is the best thing for the front house? and i always say that the people you should talk to at the front of house they know so much they hear the conversation they do. which i usually have headphones on most in my pocket i will, when i go to a museum i always have my headphones on i listen to music um but when i come up to people like nearby i'll turn my music down and listen to what they're saying and I'm, I'm just hearing that that's what front of house does so why are you right. not talking to them and saying what were they saying were they saying that like the, the, the cafeteria should be open later or you know, start open it earlier and, but even if you get that information museums have to act so right. usually on my side i have a screen that says uh, listen uh, uh, listen listen understand and act because action is the most important part of all, all this you can listen all you want and see everything you want but you've got to prove that you're doing it in their lifetime right which is where museums are failing right and it's i feel fortunate here i mean as we've talked about we've got this art program yeah here that we've been able to kind of give in the latitude to do a lot of experiments yeah. and be able to do things on the fly and like try out if it doesn't work shift it sometimes in the, during the middle of the program um shift it yeah but it's I, we're we're lucky to be able yeah. to have that and then to be able to maybe use those little experiments as a demonstration something well this goes into that research and development area and right now are the area that i would classify ourselves in right now is the research and development area for museums and for probably society because we're all going oh smartphones aren't going away this new technology is not going to go away okay we got to do something about this and wearable technology where smartphones took us like four or five years to get used to wearable technology is like here right so we're now in this thing where but it's playtime, and it's a great time for museums to go out and prototype and, and try different things and go, like, well, we tried it, it didn't work, but we're not going to say that that's a final thing. So we, tr we tried it, we tried it for 30 days, which is where the museum time comes into. Right. Because it has to be now, it can't be two years from now. You can't program this, this stuff into it now. So what you're essentially doing is a layer on top of the traditional. Right. Which, fine, if, if, you're, if this museum is willing to do that, that is brave and that is fantastic. A lot of them aren't even willing to try that one, right. you know, and that's where they're going to fail themselves because they're not moving at the same pace as society is. Right. Just, a, I'm just curious. Anybody here have an Apple Watch? Anybody here have one? I have one on order at home. There you go. So there. <laughs> oh, you have to have seen that one coming, right? Like, I give you enough clues about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did you get? I, I stupidly left it to them to order, so I don't know. Because I'm not going to use it anyway. I just need to know what it's about. Sure. Yeah. So. Absolutely. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Yeah. That's what you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. I'm um, here, and I go to Geneva to talk about wearable technology. So this is where it, it, it is. It is coming up. Um, let's take some analog questions um, from the audience. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mark? So you're not happy with selfie sticks. Are you ready for mini drones and especially around extremely large installations or artifacts? Yeah, um, the drones I find really interesting because a friend of mine has them, um, but the regulations on them is you can't do them around people. So it's going to be a different, especially in the UK, you're not, you can't do them. But I think actually the museums can have a really good, especially a place like this, which is so huge, to do the drone overview and let, let people see how big it is. I don't think it's not. As long as it's done properly, I don't have an issue with them. Yes? How do you deal with the issue of copyright when you are streaming or doing your periscope event within a museum when there are many times we will have artists who do not want uh, their material shown, you even alluded to it with the music, but how do you deal with that control from people who 
you, you, you ask permission. That, that's why right now it's going to be you ask permission before you do it or you have signs up to say you can't. So some of the museums that I go to will have a room where all the contemporary art, which is not, which is copyrighted, is in one room. And it just says you can, you can take photographs wherever you are, but not that one room. And that's a little bit easier to handle, but it is that, it, it's asking permission. So in the UK, we, we've been doing that for a while now. Really? Um, yeah, and, and we get so many tourists that are coming in and using that instead of having actual changing over to currency. So it is it is going to be one of the things that museums need to, to worry about. But also the, the problem comes in then is how do you accept different payments? Like how do you accept a yen on, onto something? But we're, we're working through that, but it's only the big ones that are, are, are able to do that. At this point, but yeah, it is. It is going to. But I mean, I came over here. Actually, I'll, we're, we're, we're. I'm going to another country. I have no money for that other country yet because I'm not. But I'm not worried because I'm like, I'll either get it at the airport or I'll just pay with my debit card, which doesn't charge me anything. Because it, it's not like when our parents went and it was like extortionate to get it all transferred. We're all doing it via our cards and um, things. So yes, I think that the. It's just going to be the way it's paid. It's going to be the awkward thing for for museums to change their systems. <laughs> Natural History Museum in London is always going to be my favorite, okay? And I can tell you why. When I, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, I don't know if you can hear the accent because apparently it's really weird now, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody remembers encyclopedias, but we, you know, I am that old that we had an encyclopedia, and in one of the encyclopedias there was a picture of the Natural History Museum in London. And I was like, that is amazing, that site is amazing. And then I went to, to England, I, I moved over there, and that was, I literally dropped off my suitcase and went right there. And I, so I, I helped them like with, with their social media in the very beginning to get them online and stuff, um, which is why I talk about them a lot. But I don't know how many I've been to. I'm very, very lucky and very blessed about what I get to do. I get to travel around the world. Um, I've been to Russia for three weeks. And I met you in, I met you in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. I, met, I met Sylvia in Poland. Yeah, I have to pick up strangers along the way. Apparently, they're all good. Um, but yeah, no, and, and the, the beauty of it is, is I always pick up something good out of every museum that I go into. Even if it's a, a bad experience, I pick up a lesson that I hopefully like, translate into a, a good, good positive spin on it at the end. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, because I don't want to keep going back to London was, is, my, is my main issue. Because um, I travel a lot and I barely speak English well, um, it's usually <laughs> something that, that, that will, in a different country, in a different language, I will pursue. Oh, you know what I'm going to talk about is the Polytech Museum in Russia, and that was in Moscow. And again, did not know any of the language at all, but their experience was enough that I didn't need to know the language. And they were using digital on tech in such a creative way that you didn't know you were using digital on tech. And I think that is a, is, is a really important thing when it's seamless. So what were they doing? That? So there was, a, there, was, um, there was a board with a well-known actor in Russia who was asking you where you wanted to go. And then you had to, like, to point to the map where you wanted to go and they would respond to you and give you that information. But it was almost like, it was like magic. Like when you pointed, you didn't touch anything. But it was like all well, things in reality. Like when you when you pointed, it would do something for you. And I just thought that was really intuitive. I mean, all the kids would not leave the area. You're like, move away, kid. I'm down to go now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I was on to film with that. <laughs> so the entrance area, and then they only offered it to you. No, throughout, and that was okay. Okay. It was throughout. So if you, because it was such a big area, so it. it uh, they were, they were doing one of these lovely things where they, they, they closed the museum for like a couple of years to redo it. But instead of just closing it and leaving it, they opened up a temporary building. So it was in this temporary building and they were doing this prototyping. They were just like, let's shove all the technology in there and see what works and 
what can get bashed about and people can use. So that was a real wonderful experience for me, especially with, with the text things that are going on. Um, and then I'm just trying to think of where, where else I've been that, that's quite, um, yeah, I can't think of, I'll, I'll say here, but also, yeah, okay, I'll say here. Uh, but you know, I, I, I think, that, you know, another one that I love and it frustrates the hell out of me is the Sewing Museum, the, the, the Sewing Museum in London. Because mm -hmm. um, you're, not, you're not allowed to take photos in there and you're not allowed to have your backpack. Like, so all my securities are left at the door, right? And it's like, but it makes you stop and look at the art and it's like so crammed in there with architectural stuff. And there's no piece of the sound museum that... In London? Yeah. It, by Russell Square. Um, and that is just because it forces you to stop and look at things. And and because it, it was the, about the architect, it, it, you're looking at things that you wouldn't normally look at because you don't have your phone which does kill me a little bit, but I, I, I respect them. How do you feel about just kind of bouncing off that a little bit, like like digital detox camps and things that try I to- I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand for people why that's needed, but that's, my, my life is off my phone. My life is off, right. off, that my work is off of it. So it's like, yeah, that's great that people can go on holiday and leave their phones there, but um, I am never off work because I love what I do. So, and, and, and because I am international, Sure. I'm talk, I'm, you're, you're dealing with different time zones, right. so I'm never, you know, I never really off, which is good for me. Um, so a lot of this conversation, and understandably so, has focused on technology. Yeah. Um, but I'm just trying to get to what extent uh, do you think that there's something like within the technology that offers opportunities for engagement, and to what extent do you think it's mainly important to just keep up with some of this technology because that's what audiences are. Well, this is, I, I kind of addressed that before when I was saying about people brought their phones into the museum before the museums reacted. Mm -hmm. So people are wearing Fitbits now. People are starting to wear wearable technology even though they don't know that that's what it's called. And it's not that I want the museum to change anything, but I want them to be aware that this is happening. And if they see a trend that is happening, and we've got to talk about trends also, yeah. if we see a trend that's happening for your museum, then act on it. But if it's not, then that's fair enough. But I, I don't want technology to take over museums. I, that's not what I'm advocating at all. But you can't ignore it. And, and you, you could have said 10, 15 years ago that that's, you know, we could stop that. The Stella Museum stopped that from, from happening. But again, I don't know how much longer they can last. They got like a cult following, but there's, you're gonna stop, you, 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 there's only so many people who can go. So uh, you, you have to make sure that it's the strength. Are, are you still getting cues outside then fine, they stick with what you're doing, but if the numbers are going down like so many are, you better look at what the people are doing and, and see if you can embrace that into your new, new regime. So playing off of that with wearable technology, what's one of the biggest opportunities that's being missed right now? I think it's the whole research and development thing. I think museums aren't taking advantage of the fact that we as a society are used to the word prototype, are used to the word playground, are used to the word that the fact that let's try and test this out. You know, we, we say it's okay to prototype a car, we say it's okay to prototype certain things, but yet when we say it's, you know, prototype an exhibition, it's like, oh my God, no, because that, now you're showing that you're not an expert. Right. You're not God. Let's go back to that step again. Like, you know, let's, let's find your name in the Bible, you know, because you're not. So let's, yeah. let's remind you of that. And yeah, it is, it is, I come across strong and I realize that. And usually I can say because I'm American, but hey, I'm here, I can't say that. Um, <laughs> because everybody has a strong accent. You can say you're Italian. Yeah, 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 you can say you're Italian <laughs> for Brooklyn. Um, but, but, but the fact is, is that we need to take advantage of this research and development. People, I mean, even my mom knows what a 3D printer is, right? She, my mom's a type of person who still thinks that Facebook is the internet. And, that, and that's fine. <laughs> and that, that is absolutely fine for, for her to do that. And she doesn't know about Twitter, which is really great. Um, <laughs> this is bad enough on Facebook. But yeah, I, th I think that you need to start playing and getting the 3D printers, and do, which is where Museum Mix sure. UK comes in and which is where the museum camp type thing comes in. Right. And it's about listening to the people. Because I, I like, one of the big things that I do is I don't just talk about museums, right? I do, but I, I also work with publishing and I work with tech and I work with charities and I work with other ones. And you, you listen to what they're saying and you see what you can extract into because we're all, nobody has money. And we were saying this earlier, no money means you gotta be creative. And museums, who should be creative are failing that right now because they're it's they're dealing with museum time. They'll start being creative three years down the line when we're all at the amusement park. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, I don't think those might have directions. But we'll go this one. What are the trends? The well wearable technology is one of them, research and development is one of them. I think people um, expecting to be entertained 24-7 is, is, is one of them. You gotta look at things like YouTube and Netflix and see what, what why why that's attracting people, why people are not leaving because of that. But also look at trends like um, you guys got Audi here, right? Like you, you look at trends like Audi because you know they snuck up on everybody, didn't they? Like you know, especially in, in 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 Europe, nobody heard of them. Now they're number one uh, food food place, and they, they don't do they don't care about brand. Right. So it's it's looking at what's working in other sectors to find out what the trends are for you. Well, I think here it's like the whole slow food kind of movement and like you know, things that are much more local, yeah. localizing things. And I think there actually is a movement a little bit, almost like a little, not so much against the technology, but the idea of slowing down. Yeah. Is that there is, like it does move too fast at the point like yeah. it's slowing down. It's I think my phone away. <laughs> no, no, never. Um, <laughs> but I think the recession also made us look yeah. at things differently. So we were all moving at a certain pace and the recession happened and we all were like, whoa, we don't have the money for this luxury anymore. Right. So then museums have to be like, well, we're not a luxury. Like this, we, this, this should be something that you want to do, which is where layers that you're doing can help. Right. Well, then you moved into a lot of collection shows and yes. things like yeah. that. And that's and actually, I think that can be a good thing in a way to re-examine what's already there. And how do you make that fresh so it doesn't feel like it's just the same static thing that's there yeah. all the time? And it can be a huge strength. I think it, in a certain way. I think when you guys come across as learning with us, right, helps a lot also. So when when a museum's like you know help me more you know so, something like a mascot or whatever um, that is almost as done properly that could be that could be an engaging thing to build your community up. Well, I think there's a certain sincerity and authenticity in a lot of that too. So yeah, this is why I gotta be careful, but this is why marketing. Right. Is, no, it's, yeah. I think it's a big piece of it. I mean, one of the prior projects that I did at the Walker. I mean, one of the big pieces of that is that we put a call out to the public that we invited proposals to come and the big thing is we meant it. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And that was the thing, it yeah. wasn't doing it in some sort of token type of way. We actually meant it and you gotta have all the messy stuff that comes with it. Yeah. And deal with it, which isn't the, that's not the safest thing. Which kind of brings back to the museum next. Like we, we, we were talking about the inclusive. Now what I'm sure the museum is thinking because of what currently happened here, it's not going to be the papers that people from Europe will Exactly, yeah. So we're going to see. So I, I heard about this also about the language and, and the terminology that we're using is is could all be English, but we are using it so intertwined right now that we're confusing ourselves in conversations. Right. So um, yeah, and, and so but it, it, that, then it goes back to that. Keep asking why or what they meant. Well, one quick question to the museum next conference that's coming. So. What's the difference between a European museum conference and an American museum uh, conference? Yeah, you're going to make, okay, without <laughs> insulting anybody, uh, no, I, I'll, I'll do my best not to insult anybody. Here. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think, I think there's, there's a lot more of the non-academic sharing with Museum X. It's, it's about the current situation, it's about issues that are happening now and issues that, that you know, not talking about things from 20 years ago or whatever. Sure. Um, and there's more of that because it's coming from different countries and you've got different different people from all around the world who are, who are taking part in it. You get a real flavor for other issues. And again, it's about extracting things that work for you and don't, don't work for you, but it's very social. Museum that can be really, really social. There's always events around it. It's actually the, the, the talks, you're, you are always engaging in everything, but you, you are waiting for that coffee moment and you are waiting and they're, they're integrated in. And we have a system where like, if, if if you're talking for more than five minutes, just take it outside. And that's great that you're taking it outside. <laughs> Do you have a couple more questions? I think for Mara? Yeah. Yeah, so how would you encourage somebody who might be like social network shy, so like somebody who has a Twitter and they maybe tweet once or twice, but like they see a hashtag on the wall, they wanna share, but they're like, this is this might not fit my feet or this might not Go be my it. real opinion. Now, it, well, it, it has to be your own opinion. So you can you can just say I, I like this or I don't like it, or you can even just say, do you like this? Yeah. So it, it, you don't even have to state anything with it, which which is good marketing here. But I'm going to bring in culture themes, which is another thing a hash, uh, account that I run, and once a month I run a hashtag, and it's for anybody to get involved with. It's the public, it's it's museums, whatever. And like this month, it's museum stairs. So it's just like, so you, you know, you just take a picture of a stair or, you know, that's in a museum, or if you see somebody tweeting about it, it's just a really safe platform for you to get engaged with Twitter 
And then if somebody tweets a mu uh, museum stairs that you like, you can then contact them and just say, I like what you just did. Now you're starting slowly. Now your numbers are starting to go up a little bit more. I got a good question that came in here on our Twitter feed. Can cultural institutions get comfortable with criticism as a normal part of social interaction and community building? I think they have to. I think that's it. But whether they will or not, I think uh, again, it's going to be uh, it's going to be down to the management. I, I think it, I think mission statements are so important, but I think mission statements are so outdated. And so I usually say to people, as long as you're following your mission statement, you're fine. But then I'm starting to <laughs> read their mission statements. I'm like. Okay, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. So, um, do the question one more time. Sorry, no, I'm so I, I think just to, to summarize, like you know, how do how do culture institutions get more comfortable with dealing with criticism that comes through social media, and like how do you make that maybe, maybe more of a you turn it into a dialogue instead of a defensive posture? Yeah, and that that would be the thing is don't yeah. do this. But that's the person who who is running the accounts mm -hmm. has to have that personality. If the person running the account is not social. You're doomed to, to begin with, um, and and um, knowing that uh, if you want really good examples of that one, look at trains and planes. So look at look at Air right. Airline, look at British Airways, look at Virgin Trains and things like that. They get criticism every single day. You, yeah. know, you made me late for my father's funeral. You made me late for this, <laughs> thing. and they have to handle. It. But you, if you also notice, they only work in four-hour shifts. Because right. there's only so much criticism. But it's again, it's a lesson that museums can learn off of this one sure. because it is, it is always being that positive. Sorry, you have to go through this. Sorry is a wonderful word. You, know, you, you as a person don't have to mean it, but you as an institution better mean it. You know, and you shouldn't be afraid to say it. And, right. and then somebody go, well, they apologize. That's great. Are you, are you saying I should have apologized? So it is, it is that thing. But it's again, it's that conversation. How, how would you handle it in real life? Because that's all social media is. It's the same conversation by online, you know, behind the screen. I like you diffuse some of it. Because there's a lot of people that do stuff online that would never do it person. Which annoys the true. hell out of me. Like, <laughs> I see people complaining all the time, like, you know, oh, you know, my, my dinner's 20 minutes late. I'm like, did you talk to the waiter? So before you told me this, you're actually going like, to say something to the waiter. Because I can't help you. Yeah, I, I don't know what you expect me to do. Um, but yeah, and I think that's when it starts to get in a bad thing. But we're seeing more and more of the... Twitter community and the Facebook community squashing that, actually turning their noses up on it and saying to people, right. like, did you call them out on it? And saying, you know, did you did you actually say something to the person face to face who you're complaining about? Or are you so passive aggressive, which we've talked about is a great technique, which I haven't learned. <laughs> I, I just go right Staying for I don't, yeah, 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 I, I go right for sarcasm, <laughs> which isn't always the best either, but I, passive aggressive is good. Yeah, I'll pick you in Minnesota sometime. I'll teach you about passive. <laughs> <laughs> you think you think you're living in England? I would get this now. Like they are so passive aggressive there. Like they could they could be really rude to you right to your face, and you say that because they say it in the accent, right? <laughs> is there any one last question out here? Um, so you mentioned that uh, social media is just conversations, but on screen. Do you think that museums need to be sort of weighed? Um, digital visitors versus physical visitors. Oh, um, thank you for bringing that up because that's one thing we missed and we did talk yeah. about is um, the, the lurkers of the world are, are fantastic. So it, it is the ones who who will never step foot in your your museum or your institution, but they will be your biggest advocate um, because they heard of great things through their friends or their their second cousin went to this museum and had a great experience. And then when they see somebody else talking about, it, they're like, "Well, I've never been, but my second cousin has been, so it's really great." Um, and I do think it's, it's you have to invest time in talking to the non-visitors, and that means the ones who, who are following you for whatever reason. It could have been through Ask a Curator Day or through some other event, they're following you, but they're never going to visit you. They're in Australia, they're in a different country, but, but you never say never. Because I was following a few in France years ago, that I, and, and, I, and I was like, oh, they're so nice because they talk to me, and they talk to me in English. It's like, oh my god, it's fantastic. And then I went to France for uh, to Paris for a visit, and um, I actually went to them. Now I'm even a huger advocate of them, right? I don't like their collection, and I have to be very honest with it. Like, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think it was on social media; the collection was much better. Um, but yeah, you know, that. But I'm still an advocate for them. But I was an advocate before, so anytime somebody was even going to France, they weren't even going to Paris. I was like, "You're going to France? You gotta go to this museum." 
And it's Museum of the Colony, I could say, but I'm ashamed that they're running around like their collection. Um, but yeah, so it's Museum of the Colony. And I would tell people all the time, like, this is a great museum. And they're like, what, what did you like about it? I'm like, well, I've never actually been. <laughs> but, but they're really good on social media. Um, but yeah, so, so you don't have to actually be a physical visitor to be an advocate and be part of that community. You know, so it was, I, I, when I went to Paris to Museum of the Colony, I got to meet the director. Just be, j they had no idea who I was, but just from social media, it was that dialogue that was happening. So it is, it's, it, I always say it's so powerful and it, a lot of it is driven by a hashtag, which, you know, up until about 15 years ago was a pound symbol on a phone. <laughs> yeah, and, and now it's just transformed the way we talk, the way we interact, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, luckily my daughter does not do like hashtag ha, you know, or something like that. But, um, but you, like I said to you before, you put a hashtag on the wall and that gives permission for people to share. Well, it's also a way from the museum so that we mine documentation. Yeah, yeah. So but I don't care about you guys. I know you don't, but I do. <laughs> so it's my job. <laughs> Somebody's got to share this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will say that is a hilarious thing because I put on all these events online and I do, I go like world trending and I get like all these statistics. And people are like, how many people took part? I'm like, I have no idea. I don't care. That that when the day's over, the day's over. If you want to, if you want to analyze it, God bless you. My life's too short. Yeah, and they're just numbers, and numbers can be. It's true. it's true. All right. Um, I've got one last question. We'll see if anybody else has one last one. So, what's harder? Museum week, getting museums all organized to do things, or ask the curator day, getting curators to participate? Ask the curator. <laughs> ask the curator is much more difficult. The time that's invested with ask the curator day starts the, the day after the last year. So as soon as September 16th or whatever day it is, September 17th, I'm already getting institutions contacting me and going, we think we showed our curator that is not evil. Like, can, can you start with it? So I've actually started, uh, yeah. And, um, it's a, but what it is, and it's a lot, it's a lot to do with management, it's a lot to do with everything. It's about, I don't, I give permission to people even though I don't have the authority, but people just want that permission. They just want to say, yeah, you can do it. And you build that confidence up on people. Right. Who am I? Like, I never worked a day in my life in a museum, right? But yeah, I'm telling these curators, oh, you can do this. It's okay, you can't mess up. Maybe they can, but as long as I told them that they are okay with it, they're willing to give it a go. That takes a year <laughs> for, yeah, yeah. for the next one. But we slowly, we slowly are getting there. I think we had 700 uh, curators sign up this this last year. Um, we had about six participate from here yeah. again last year, and it was it was fun to watch throughout the day because people started to get into it because they got the more confidence. And, and they realize that it's really fun to talk about the stuff that yeah. you love. But the people and are actually asking them. And that's right. even, that's even, they're like, wow, we're not nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one day for them to geek out, right? You think that they would be on it and they would be like, hey, let's, let's do this. But they also have that thing of they, they can't do a tweet, like they'll do an answer over five tweets. I'm like, you're missing the point. <laughs> the whole thing is to truncate it into no, one. No, it becomes an essay over. Yeah, over. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when they start doing links, you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, we, we're not going to read a blog post now. <laughs> like, this is not the day for it. Um, but yeah, I think I think because also it, it is just curators in theory. It's, it's mainly difficult. Have you had any success those curators in becoming more regular tweeters? Then? Absolutely. I get all the time I get people saying thank you. My curators got their own account now. Or or what happens is they'll say, and this is always a great one, it's like, we signed up, but we're only doing it for 45 minutes. And then like 7 o'clock at night, they're still there. It's like a drug for them. Like they finally got introduced to it. Like in their 45 minutes, going to, just going to do it in my lunch hour. And I was like, did you get any work done today at all? Because like, you know, you're going home and you're doing it. So, no, I hear a lot of success stories and it's always wonderful. A museum selfie day did the same thing. Yeah. It got it got institutions online because they were like they didn't have an account for some reason. So, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a final question from the audience. Any one last question? You said you pick things up from everywhere you go. What did you pick up from the IMA? Uh, yeah, I do. I don't like you. <laughs> now, um, I think I, you know what's interesting about the IMA, and again, I'm leaning forward so you can see I'm getting a little bit defensive here. <laughs> you can read my body. Um, I think what's interesting is right now it's been the transition for the $18 entrance fee. I don't think I got the real IMA, and I, I can be completely honest with you with that one because I'm progress in the projects that are coming out of it, and the fact that they're so eclectic with their collection. Is amazing, and I I actually spent time three days here, just wandering around with my headphones and things, and I've seen 
today I've seen a lovely group of, of solar generations, I'll call them, hopefully not insulting them, who all had hats on for some reason, to, um, to young teenagers yesterday that, that were really engaging with the art, and, 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 um, and I forget where I was at at that point, but it was like they were actually having like a dialogue. So this truly is something for everybody here. Uh, but I am the type of person who, I annoy people because I, 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 I always do pay attention, although <laughs> people will argue with that, but I, like, I'm wondering why there's no, nobody sitting there. Like, I'm so observant, like, I'm always trying to figure out why is that area not nobody sitting there and everybody's like sitting over there. So when I say I'm paying attention, not just to people in art, it's also to the surrounding that's around it, uh, if that makes any sense. But no, I think there's a lot of great stuff that's going here and there's a lot of forward movement. There's a lot of questions. Still, um, there's a lot of. I think that for the IMA, I think that there's such a transitional period right now that nobody knows. And then you get somebody like me is going in and going, well, why, or, or why not? Like, if I, if, I, if I can't do something, I'm asking why not. Um, and I don't know if the answer is there yet, but well, but meanwhile, the public don't know anything about that, so that's great. But you know. I know. <laughs> I am sorry. This is why I'm not allowed to have a microphone. <laughs> um, so I will, I will follow up that with one last question for you. So as the IMA, what's one thing that you think that we could do immediately um, better? I, I, okay, we're just working on time. Yeah, but I think I was talking to you about this earlier, so I, can, yeah. I hope I can be so really honest about this. Fun. Okay, so so I, I don't know if you need to be open because it's really hard. You guys close at five. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. most people work on five, so yeah. I'm really struggling. Like how are how are people going to actually mm -hmm. visit? So if I am doing so, if I if my my job is to go to museums, so that's great. But if, if my job is an office from mm -hmm. nine to five, how am I supposed to get here and see anything? So I think that's a, a big conundrum for you guys right now, and uh, I think you know late nights or you know in in London and again I apologize, but not just London. A lot of places are doing one night a week too late, mm -hmm. um, but on that then they close early another night. So right. it might be something that just needs to be looked at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I again that that's going to be a hard one for you guys to address. But I think just think as a, as a as a mom, I'm just thinking how would I get here other than the right. weekends? So. Well, on your own, I think it's something we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Like, things aren't going to happen overnight, but it's... No, but it's all, I, I don't care about it happening overnight. I, I just don't want to go into museum time. I want the conversation to keep going. And when right. the conversation's not going to get going, then, yeah. then I'm going to go in again. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thank you guys for joining us. I hope to see you at a, a future talk here. I think our next talk, I could be, could be.